Hey everyone, we're going to review everything we've talked about when it comes to modules. So you can get this code up on my GitHubs. The Caleb Curry is the name, Python is the repo. And you can just copy this, paste it into your editor. And you are also going to need another file, which is actually utils.py. So this is actually just a function. We're going to work with that importing modules if you feel you need to do that. So what we're going to do is take this and you can pull this repo or just create the file yourself, whatever you feel you want to do. And we'll go into our editor, say new file, utils.py, and paste that code in there. So now we should be able to use that module. So let's go over into the code and we'll just go through it and see what everything's doing. So we'll start at the very top, which is right here. So first thing is I show you guys how to import modules, which is pretty simple. You just say import and then whatever the module name is. These are just Python files or they can actually be folders and in that situation they're known as a package. However, importing them and working with them works exactly the same way. So when you print one of these modules, what do you get? Well you get the module name and also the file location. So if you want you can open that location and see what's in it or see some of the other modules. If you want to just open that file, you can open it inside of Visual Studio Code just by following the link and looking through the code here. So that is how you would open a module to see its code. But we're not going to work with that right now. We're just going to continue our code here. You can also find a link with all of the different modules you can use. Here's a documentation page and open that and take a look at this. This is the Python module index. Lots of different stuff in here, but you can find whatever you're looking for. For example, pickle, which is what we just were working with a second ago. Next up, we actually talk about using the different members in these modules. So any of the functions or variables in these modules are going to become available to us when we import that module. Now there is mechanisms to only expose certain members. However, we don't have to worry a whole lot about that. But if you're wondering what that is exactly, if you go in a module, you can search in here for all and these are the members that are being exposed so when you import this module those are the things that are going to be available to you so an example of using a member is printing math.py which gives us 3.14159 and then we show here printing the type of math and you can see it's an instance of module so we're working with a an object of type module and anytime we have an object we access its members using the dot operator so that's where that syntax comes from Here's another example of getting a pseudo random number 0 through 100 inclusive. So it could be 0, it could be 100. This comes from the random module, and this is the randint method. So we get 12 in this case. You can see how this works by opening random.py if you were interested. So holding command here, I can click random and scroll through this to find the code. But essentially, what it does is it uses another method and passes the data we passed in into it. So fortunately a lot of this stuff is available to us to go look at so you can see how things work. We talked about in that in an earlier video so go watch that if you're really interested in the details. And here's just some more notes talking about all that's what's exposed and how they're behind the scenes creating an instance of random so that the user of the module doesn't have to worry about it. So if they weren't doing that, it'd be a little bit of extra work where you'd actually have to create an instance by saying random dot random and assigning that to a variable. However, we don't have to worry about that. Another way to import modules is to say from module name import member, whatever that member is. In this case, we're saying from random import rand int and seed. So then those are the only two things we're able to use and they're available directly. So we don't have to prefix with random. So we could just say rand int 5, 5, which is always going to give us the value 5. This replaces anything locally called randint. So if we create this super important string, when we do this and print it, what it's going to do is it's going to replace it because now we no longer have that string. We get whatever we get when we print the randint coming from the module. Next up, we talk about aliases, which allows us to change the name for a module or a member of a module if we use the syntax here. But in this case, we're importing random as r, so then we would say r.randint. Or if you want to import a specific thing such as randint, you can say as ri, and then that's how you would access it. So just a little bit of a way to protect your variable names or to be specific on what you want to call it. And in this situation, we can still access this randint data 
because we didn't replace it, which is why we get this value here. Now there's another import option, which is import asterisk, which is going to import all of the members. So from random, import randint is the way we've done it so far, but if you wanna just import everything, you would just say from random import asterisk. And that's gonna replace any variable. So in this case, we have a variable seed with the value watermelon. That's actually replaced. So when we do a string like today, we are going to plant watermelon. What actually comes out is today we are going to plant and then this output for a method. And then it says seeds, yay. So obviously that makes no sense. So you just gotta be really careful with the import asterisk as it's a really high chance of replacing things that exist already in your code. Especially if you're working with numerous modules, you might be replacing stuff you don't even realize it. So be really, really cautious. I'd recommend you don't do this for most cases. You can get a better picture of this by printing out dir. So when you do this, it creates a bunch of output here and has all of the identifiers in scope. So for example, I just put a bunch of them here and you can go in here and find them. So there's A and B and so forth. But yeah, that, that'll show you that how much information is brought into scope when you do import asterisk. Next up, we talk about creating our own module. You just create a Python file, which we created just a few minutes ago, and you just say import utils. Nothing special about the file. The syntax is exactly the same as any other Python file. You don't have to say def module or anything like that. You just create functions and you're good to go. Now back in here, we can use this by saying utils dot and then whatever that method is called. Next up, we talked a little bit about syspath, which is a module that's always available to us. Here's an example of how you can change the prompt inside of the interactive mode. Doesn't show up here. However, if you were to run this code in interactive mode, you would see this change to the C greater than sign, which you can get that from the docs in this documentation right here. But anyways, the point is this sys is always available to us and we can actually use it to determine where modules are searched for. So for example, we can say, hey, we wanna search for this module in this path here. Or you can be a little bit more dynamic using this example code here, which is used to grab the parent directory. So if your modules were up a folder, then this is how you would do that. Now, once this is appended to the sys.path, it'll automatically search for that. So any imports after here, that location would be valid. So that is your review of modules. It is a lot. I was gonna talk a little bit about packages, but I just decided not to do it in the series. But pretty much a package is just a folder with a bunch of different files in it that works the same way as a module. It's just a little bit different, but if you wanna know more information on that, then you can research packages. We might get into it later on, but for now, we're going to move on to something new, which is understanding sets and dictionaries and how to work with them. These are two very important data structures, so make sure you pay attention, and I will see you in the next video. Let me know if you've been enjoying the series. I'd appreciate any comments, and be sure to subscribe.